It says 10.30 and 27 seconds, so that's a little later than it would like to be. My name is Eric Crump. I'm the Executive Director of the Aerospace Center for Excellence in Lakeland, Florida. You're welcome with this weather. Um, it's all me. It's all me. I left St. Pete last night. It was like 78 degrees. Um, and I got off the airplane in Appleton and I did not immediately freeze to death. So I was like, okay, that, it works. It works. <laughs> it's very active meeting. Um, in a, another facet of my life, nearly about two months ago, I also joined the board here at Redbird, as Tom mentioned earlier. And I, it's funny because when Charlie and I were first talking about, you know, is that something I'd be interested in, I told him, I said, I feel like I've kind of been on the board the whole time. Um, because I have a, um, a personal passion for uh, flight simulation and flight training, but also through my experience, I have a deep-seated passion for flight simulation and K-12 education. Um, it would be great if every kid could go to school and then walk out during recess and get an airplane and fly, uh, but that's not realistic. So what? Um, what simulation brings to the table for me is the next best thing. Um, and so, if you originally signed up for this session because you felt the big bald man, otherwise known as Greg Roark, was going to be uh, doing this session with me, sorry, but Greg is sick and couldn't make it, so you got me and Charlie. That's how it is. Yay! But Greg's intention for this session was to, to really kick off this brand new track inside migration about k education. So I've been to every migration except one because I was sick. Um, and almost every time I've come to migration, I've presented at least one breakout session having something to do with simulation education. So I'm really excited to see migration take this K-12 pathway, and I'm super excited to see all of you guys here to be a part of this for the next two days. Um, it does take a village uh, to move the needle. Um, Charlie's going to talk a little bit about why K-12 is important at Redbird, but I want to tell you a quick story uh, about me and why I'm just standing in front of you today. So, when I was a young person, many, many years ago, um, I was not a good student. Just for the sake of um, my understanding of the room, how many of you are K-12 teachers? See, okay, what about college university people? Got a few of those. Okay, and then flight training people, industry folks, do those two? Okay, cool. So for the teachers in the room, I was the kid that you went home and complained to your spouse about at night. Um, but fortunately for my teachers, I went to school when it was okay to beat kids in school. So they got to take a lot of their frustration on my rear end. Um, that was the thing. So when, when I was in elementary school particularly, I just thought school was the biggest waste of time. Like there was, I would rather be cleaning toilets than I would be to be in a classroom. I just saw no utility in it at all. I did not make good grades. I was in trouble all the time. I used to joke that I was on a first name basis with my elementary school principal. His name was Roger Miller. And if you got sent to Roger's office, you were, you were getting one password. Like you, if you went, it was guaranteed you're getting you're getting booked once. But so I would go in, he'd say, Mr. Crump, fancy seeing you here again. And I would say, good morning, Roger, which got you two. <laughs> that's for disrespect. And I, I did it just for fun. I was that kid. So some of you are like, mm, I know that kid. <laughs> Can't beat him anymore. Um, but through that experience, um, again, I just I saw no utility for school. By the time I got to middle school, my friends were progressively getting worse just like me. And so by the time we got into sixth grade, um, they were dealing drugs, and I was the lookout outside the boys' bathroom while the drug deals were going down inside. So I think my parents were aware that my life was heading in a negative direction, because I wasn't any better at home than I was at school. Um, but they knew that I liked airplanes, that I had always liked airplanes. So um, my dad said, Eric, listen, you know, we're worried about you, but we know you like airplanes. So, if you will just make the AV honor roll for one nine week period and stay out of trouble, no trips to the principal's office, we will pay for you to get a flight in a small airplane. Now, I, we had traveled commercially. I was in love with the idea of flight, but I had never actually held the controls myself. I said, challenge accepted. 
And then something amazing happened, guys. I made the straight A honor roll. Up until this point, I really thought I was stupid. I mean, I really did. And I mean, I grew up in Alabama, so like, really stupid. Um, and I really, I had no idea that I actually had the ability to learn and perform until I had this awesome motivation put in front of me. So I made the straight A honor roll. I stayed out of trouble. I took my first flight the day after my 13th birthday. It completely changed my life. Changed everything about what I thought my life was going to be. I come from a little bitty town of 15,000 people in nowhere, Alabama. I thought I was going into the family business like everybody else in my family had done. And all of a sudden, this whole new idea was presented to me. Credit and kudos to my teachers and to you guys, too, because they realized that there was a way to keep me motivated. And they found ways, not being pilots, having no flight experience themselves, but they found ways to bring aviation into their math and science classrooms, which gave me more reason to pay attention gave me a reason to go to school. Throughout middle school, I got my act together. I went to high school. And I was the only kid in my high school who flew airplanes, which was, that worked really well for me. Um, it's becoming less and less rare these days. But at that time, it was a very rare thing. I sold on my 16th birthday, which was a Sunday. So I had to get in the car with my dad and drive home from the airport because I didn't have a driver's license. So I could fly by myself before I could drive by myself. And I did fail my driving test on Monday. <laughs> the examiner guy said the light was more of a red color. I thought it was sort of an orangish color, but he disagreed, so I had to go take the driving test again. I tell you that story to tell you this story. My life was heading in this general direction, and my exposure to aviation created a light bulb moment in my brain that made me realize there's something else. There, I mean, whether I do it or not, there's another opportunity. So that got me back to like here. But then it was you guys who convinced me that I could actually follow that path. Because it was a flash in the pan for me. I had been in an airplane, and it was exciting. And I flew an airplane, and I flew over my house, and I waved the wings of my mom. And it was really cool. But it was a one and done thing. It was teachers, it was educators who found a way to keep me engaged and because I could just go out to the airport and get an airplane every day. That's, that's why we're here. That's why we're having this conversation. That's why this subtract of migration was created. Because there are a lot of me's out there. I know the universe is upset about that. But there are a lot of people like me out there who are just look. That they, it's not that they're incapable. It's not that they're bad kids. It's that they don't have any direction. They, they don't, and, and part of that is, part of that social, part of that comes from home. I get, there's a whole lot of other things there. My sister was a fourth grade teacher in a super economically depressed district in Alabama. She would come to school and find kids who had slept at the school overnight because they couldn't get in their house. So I get it, there are, there are plenty of other issues to deal with. But when we talk about the power of aviation to change people's lives, any job in aviation is a one generation escape from generational poverty. In one generation. Any job. Throwing bags on a ramp. One, one generation. This field has power. It has the power to encourage people to go to school and stay in school. And this may sound a little prophetical to some of the flight school people in the room, so give me some grace for a minute. I don't even so much care that everybody becomes a pilot or a maintenance technician or a controller. I would love it if they did. But if we can teach them to love STEM, they're going to be fine. They're going to, they're going to be fine. They'll find a career. They'll be able to take care of themselves and their families. That, so aviation is the hook. Aviation is the carrot that says there's something better than what you're doing now. You don't have to do what your dad and your mom and your uncle did before you, there's another option. But if it's just a flash in the pan, and I, I did my two young eagles flights when I was a kid and loved it, but I still didn't know how to get a pilot certificate or how do I get a job. And it was my Algebra 2 teacher, Ms. Brassfield, who sat down with me after school and searched on the newly invented internet to help me figure out what, how you could work in a, I thought you had to go to the military. I had no idea. Nobody found I was a pilot. Nobody in my family had ever been to college. 
I was the first generation in my family to go to college, first generation to graduate. And I got to put my 88-year-old grandfather in an airplane for the first time since he flew a glider into Normandy in 1945. And that was an incredibly awesome experience for me. It was like one of those life-changing things, right? Like it's an affirming deal. And I will always remember that. But there's no reason that should have been my experience other than that my parents tried and my educators tried and made an investment in me. And so for my personal purposes, as the executive director for ACE, I consider it my duty and my responsibility to make it as easy as humanly possible for every educator in the country to do exactly what my teachers did for me. Right? To engage, educate, and accelerate the next generation of aerospace professions. That's our mission statement. <laughs> what we can do now with simulation takes us to a completely different level. It opens doors that I couldn't have even dreamed of. When I took my pre-engineering class in the ninth grade, we had traffic's quick cat. It ran in DOS. It didn't have a mouse. You had to know like 17 keyboard shortcuts to draw a line. But I mean, it just like blew my mind. I see it every single day. I see kids come in, at Polk County, if you're not familiar with Central Florida, is a very agricultural community. It's very economically depressed. 30% of our kids live below the poverty line. Most, about 85% of the schools in Polk County are Title I schools. When these kids come for field trips, they walk into the flight sim lab and they, they, they're all talking, they're talking to each other. You hear a pin drum. They're all just immediately silent. And they sit down and I ask them, how many of you think you can fly? And nobody raises their hand. And in 30 minutes, we teach them to take off, fly straight and level, make turns, climb to the sense. And they don't realize what they're doing. They're just having fun. And then at the end, I say, okay, now, how many do you think you can fly? And they always say, it's very easy for me to go to work. It's like the easiest job in the world to go to work, to, to do that, to inspire kids. However, it's also a lot easier for me to do that because I've spent the vast majority of my life as a pilot, as a corporate pilot, working as a professional pilot. It's easy for me to bring that into a classroom. But I know for a lot of educators, particularly math and science teachers who get asked by a district, not asked, but voluntold, like, hey, you're teaching the aviation elective next semester. I don't know what that means. Um, I had a teacher joke with me several years ago, and I, still, I use it all the time. Um, she got asked to teach an aviation elective, and she said, I don't even know how to spell FIA. <laughs> um, and it was just it was so funny. Um, but that's true. So it, it's not just that we need the access, but we also need the support. And that's what this is meant to do. So over the next two days, the point is for us to spend as much time together as possible in a lot of really great breakout sessions and in networking sessions together to talk about what's working, what's not working, what do we need, what's the next step, because people like this guy, believe it or not, actually want to know so they can help. So without further ado, Charlie Gray Warren, the boss man. Well, you're about to find out why I asked Eric to be on our board. <laughs> the, um, you know, I, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about why Redbird has decided that K-12 is such an important part of our business. So we, we put massive amounts of resources behind this. We've developed curriculums. We've developed products specifically for this space. Um, he actually, well, thank you. See, this, this is why I asked him to be on the board to help me out. Yep. Thanks, Eric. You're welcome. Um, the story he just told us exactly, exactly illustrates why we're doing this. And I'd like to be able to tell you when we first started the company that this was the goal all along, but that's just not how life was. Right? Our goal when we started this company was, honestly, to have a few sims in our garage because I couldn't afford to fly anymore, neither could the rest of the, and we just wanted one to, to play with. And at some point along the way, 
as we're developing these sims for our garage, somebody said, hey, we should go to Oshkosh. We should like see if anybody else wants to buy them. We'll build another one. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Right. We're all going to get sims for our garage, right? This is what we're going to do, and we may build a few more. To this day, I don't have my sim. Todd doesn't have his sim. Jerry doesn't have his sim. But we started down this path and realized that what this technology could do for this industry that we love, that we are very passionate about. And as you start looking, as you release these things into the world, and you start seeing how people start picking them up, and honestly, we never had thought about a high school program at the time. I, I went to a small <coughs> Catholic high school, 50 kids in my graduating class. Um, the electives were basically, you know, chapel or Bible or, you know, that was, that, that was, those were the options we had. And now I start running into these, these high schools who are saying, hey, we have an aviation program, an aviation program. I, you know, that, that, would, that was a foreign concept to me for, for totally different reasons. Um, but we loved aviation and we wanted to build something and we wanted to take the technology that was available for uh, military and airlines and bring this down to make it accessible in the GA marketplace. And in, and in doing so, we kept bringing it down, bringing it down, finding new places to be able to say, this could be used here, this could be used here. And you know, aviation for, for many, many years had, had dwindling new pilot starts and Boeing and everybody else is talking about, oh, we're going to have this big pilot shortage, all these pilots are going to retire, what's going to happen, what's going to happen? And you, you start looking and going, well, if we go after these pilots in, at college or even after college, it's too late. Or if, I, at, if, we, if we try to convince them at that point, it's too late. Let's take, take a step back. Let's take a step back. And we built a we built a sim that was for home. We figured that this would be really useful in in uh, classrooms as well, and especially in, a, in an environment where you have one teacher and twenty students. You know, how, how are you going to do that with a large sim? Or how are you going to do that with an airplane? And so, we start building these devices that might work well in labs and, and so on and so forth. And we sell them, and the, one of the first flight schools that adopted them wholesale, the CTE director of the district bought them. He's an aviator. And, um, dropped him in this high school and Vala told a, a science teacher to say, hey, go teach aviation. And she said, oh, great, where's my curriculum? Where's my lesson? And they came to us and said, where's our lesson? I said, I don't even know what a lesson is. I build the hardware. This is what I do. And we realized at that point, we saw what this school was trying to do, said, we can help. This could, we can do something. Now, we're not going to develop all the solutions, but we hope to be a a uh, company that can bring the technology and bring things together, bring all of the components together to help build what you guys are doing and help support what you're doing. So that's really what this migration track is about. It's not about, okay, here are the new Redbird products that we're gonna that we developed for that classroom. If if you leave this uh, migration with a feeling that, wow, I you know, that I learned all about the new Redbird products, but I didn't I can't take anything back. Um, about you know how do I actually integrate this stuff? How do I use it? I didn't make any new contacts, and migration is going to fail you. And that's that's not you know the goal. The goal here is for you guys to talk to each other, to network, to get ideas, to share ideas, to help grow this. We are not going to be able to solve all these pilot shortage, aviation shortage. I think we talk about pilot shortage, but it's everything. It's engineers, it's mechanics, it's you guys. We're actually going to do a panel uh, tomorrow on workforce development. And some of you are going to be on, on the panel. Um, it's how are we at attacking this? And how early is too early? And Eric will tell you how, how young are the kids that you're, that you're starting to have? So, uh, before we shut down everything for uh, flying prep three weeks ago, our youngest participant in story time is three weeks old. Um, he's like this big, um, but uh, maybe that's true. That's a little early. Also, uh, at the at the flying in our youth workshop area, I was walking through there, and this, this granddad has a 20 month old with a rivet gun, popping rivets in our CH750 fuselage, and I was like, okay. I mean, I hope he signed a waiver or something because that's a little big kid. The rivet gun was bigger than the kid, I think. Um, but it's to, to answer your question, it's never too early. Yeah. It takes multiple. It takes multiple touches. It takes multiple yeah. opportunities and multiple people. One person can't do it all. And I think this is where this is where we're starting to see a problem, and 
in that we're seeing these pockets of solutions pop up, middle school, high school, college. There's very little thing, little that's connecting them all together. Right? AOPA is doing a great job with their curriculum. We need middle school stuff to feed into that. We need that to help feed into college. We need to create a curriculum, uh, a continuum for these students that are going through this so that they can get interested and we can keep them interested all the way through. And either get involved in aviation or use this to be, you know, in, in whatever career path they decide, they decide in the future. So we, um, we obviously believe in this. We believe in this a lot. We're here to help support and hopefully bring together a community and get you guys working together and support you in whatever way uh, we, can, we can support that. And hopefully we, you know, preach the gospel of aviation to the next generation and pass this on and, and that's that's my uh, nickel tour. Right? As as a board member, I agree with the presentation. It's good. It's good. So, over the next two days, in these labs back here, we have a, a whole host of content. I would encourage you. There's a lot of K-12 stuff. I would encourage you also to go see some of the stuff that's about running flight school business or doing some of the instructor things. I think that there's a lot of collaboration that can happen even between these uh, segments of the industry. So. You know, Please, and let me know how we can help as you, uh, as you go more. And a special plug to Josh's state of flight training presentation. Uh, I didn't ask, how many of this group have been to migration before? And oh, the rest of you are new people? Awesome. New migration people? Wow. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, so if you're new, you haven't seen state of flight training before. It is a fantastic... You want this? Um, sure. I was afraid of being watching one more, which I'm really, I apologize. Um, but uh, state of flight training is a fabulous deep dive into the data uh, of survey data for what's going on in the flight training industry right now, and also upcoming trends. Um, Red Bird does that with several other partners. I don't want to mention any of them because I'm going to forget some of them, but if you go to the Red Bird website, there's a whole list of all the people that participate in that. It's a really awesome breakout. Um, and don't, don't tell Josh I said he was good at something because it'll go to his head, but it's a really good presentation. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I've got a really exciting breakout today at 2.30 on dual enrollment and articulated credit in high school and college programs. And if you're not asleep yet, come and visit with me at 2.30 this afternoon. Um, if that's up your, up your alley, um, I've got some data to share with you, um, some, some relatively new data just came out last year about the efficacy of dual enrollment and encouraging uh, college completion. So um, I, I want to talk about that and also try to figure out some best practice for you guys who, who build articulated credit or the programs. Um, but really, we have some time left over. We wanted to get done with uh, our song and dance so that we could kick off a conversation that hopefully lasts for the next couple of days. So if there are questions, Charlie and I can definitely pass this thing back and forth. That's all one hand is in the back already. Yep. Um, so you explained very clearly that the kids don't understand that they can fly the machine. Can you share with us psychometric why? So there's some really interesting research that's been done by a couple of FA working groups over the last couple of years. Many of you are probably familiar with them. There's a, um, a women in aviation workforce panel, also a minority in aviation workforce panel, specifically looked at what drives people to or from a potential career in aviation. And one of the interesting data points that came out of that was that there is one I mean, there's lots of awesome touch points to impact kids' lives, so don't take this the wrong way, but there's one very important touch point in a young person's life where they stop looking at something and going, that looks cool, and start looking at it and saying, how do I do that? And generally, the data comes back consistently that it's eight for girls and 10 for boys. That those are, that is a, it's a key functional flip of the brain where people start to, to stop looking at it and going, astronauts are cool, and start to say, how do I become an astronaut? So it's a, it's a, different, it's a different thought process. And so interestingly, when, when we get early adolescents in the STEM lab, they're less reluctant to try because they don't want to look like they, they don't want to fail in front of their friends. The young kids, though, man, they're thrilled. You bring a you bring a like ten year old in there and be like, "Here's a flight sim." You you have to pry him out of the seat when it's done. I tell them times up, they've got to go to another lab. They're like, "No, I'm staying." I mean, so 
I think to, to your point, it's also about understanding the, the individual learner and the place that they're in in their journey. And I, again, just from the, the flight instruction perspective, for many, many moons, we approach flight students as another person who's learning how to fly. And here's the curriculum, get in the airplane, learn how to fly. But people who have, who have taught adult learners know that a lot of that granularity that occurs with kids who, like this kid's interested in dinosaurs, this, kid, this kid's interested in race cars, by the time we get to adults, we're generally interested in how am I going to use this? And so as long as you're teaching an adult the skill and you can directly connect it to something they're going to be able to do afterward, they're generally likely to go ahead and continue learning. AOK found this out with the first flight training experience survey. That less and less it became an issue about money, which everybody thought it was money. It wasn't money, it wasn't connected to an outcome. We weren't telling people, this is what you're going to be able to do now that you've learned this skill. And so you know, I, I think we've sort of crossed that Rubicon flight training, or crossing it anyway, from an adult learner in flight training perspective. But when it comes to kids, the way a, a 10 year old and a 14 year old experience uh, aviation are going to be very, very different. Um, and trying to identify with each one of those kids as individuals, it, it, in my opinion, I'm, I'm not an expert in that particular area, I can just say, going to each simulation station and giving that child direct one-on-one -on -one attention has been successful. Because in general, I think, especially younger kids are willing to try because they don't mind failing. They don't mind if the airplane augers in immediately after they take off. But the 14-year-olds do, especially if the person sitting next to them can't do it. So when I see the kid, I go through first and I'm explaining, okay, these are the flight controls, this is how the yoke works or whatever. The kids who put their hand on the yoke and are moving it, I know they're going to try. And there's other kids who sit there with their hands in their lap and they look at it. I, I know I have to go work with that kid. I have to go, or I, I've got two people in the room with me. I will point to one of them, this one's yours. That one's going to need individual attention to make them try. I know that answers your question. But I guess the simplest thing I can say is it's approaching each one of those kids as individuals and trying to get on their level. Even when I'm talking to them, they're in a chair like you are. I don't come up and talk to you like this. I get down on my knee and talk to you at eye level because I'm trying to I'm trying to connect with you, not to talk down to you. If that makes sense. Yes, we're from everywhere. We have a dual program. Super fun. High school. Thanks for that. My kids love their doing this class. <laughs> we we continue to get requests for elementary schools. So everything that you're saying is exactly what we're hearing. Is there a particular simulator that you would recommend for that level? Because we've used the red birds in our upper, but any, what would you recommend for the elementary level? So, interestingly, um, last year, Polk County did a one-to-one -one initiative where every kid in the Polk County school system gets an, an electronic device. And they started with tablets for the younger kids and then moved it to Chromebooks and eventually to laptops, depending on age, and so they're issued a device to, to sort of close the technological divide that exists in the super economically depressed county. Um, we were fortunate to receive 300 iPads from American Airlines and mobile resellers a donation to Skylab to help with youth engagement when they come. Um, I love Infinite Flight. I love X Plane on the iPad. It's just simple because the kid has. Even if, if they, they, they've seen a, a smartphone, they've seen an iPad, they put their hands on something most likely by that point. And so giving them the opportunity to say, okay, here's this device. And again, that's a unique thing happens in Polk County. But, but when I get to do outreach and I go into that classroom and I tell these kids this, they, we download Infinite Flight and they're all playing around flying, they can take that home with them. You know, that's a really awesome way because the, the device, the hardware devices are, are in a physical location. You have to access them, you have to go to school. I would also say that one of the things I've seen that has been particularly successful, typically we, when we acquire simulators, uh, any, any fidelity level in A12, we put them in a classroom and we lock them up. And so you have to be in that classroom to use them. Schools that I've seen moving them out into media centers so that they're publicly available to all the students, 
maybe not the whole, you don't have to build a whole sim classroom, but if it's two sims and there's somebody in there Tuesday and Thursday during study hall or whatever or after school, that really helps. And it also helps with recruitment into those elective programs because more kids get to see what it is. When we take it and we lock it up and you have to be in this, again, it's making aviation exclusive, which is the last thing that we want to do, but it's, it's setting that mindset in kids' head in the very beginning as opposed to making it publicly available in a media center, you gotta take care of it, because you know, there will be kids who come up like, what happens if I punch this monitor? You know, so it does have to be supervised, it needs to be secure, I get that. But the more we can make it available, I think that helps. Um, and it, at that point, it's really less about teaching fundamental flying skills and more about just exposure and excitement. And look at this, this isn't this cool? You can go fly over your house. But I, I love, all of those, the X-Plane and Infinite Flight are both free, and of course you can pay to get different airplanes and whatever, but it's a great way for little bitty kids to put something in their hands, and they're learning some motor skills too. So I mean, there's, there's, a, there's an advantage there in early childhood too. My, again, my opinion. All these things, <laughs> totally my opinion, not endorsed by everybody. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I don't, we know endorse. Act aside, they need to sign off on it. Let me know in the breakout session. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm an elementary teacher, and in developing all of this, do you have kind of rationale for school districts or looking at it at a legislative level? I've done over the years as much as I could in my classroom, aviation related, but it, in 30 years, the, the way the curriculum has been locked down has only increased. So I've never had the freedom to do what I wanted to do because I had a very specific math curriculum and very specific reading curriculum and state tests. Right. And so I think that there's a lot of individual teachers and maybe even districts that have an interest out there. But at least the perception of the district is that they can't meet the state standards. What state do you mean? Here in Wisconsin. Okay. So like Jack was talking about difficulty in Oshkosh, um, and we recently retired from the district just a little bit north of here, and I think the reason some of the are reluctant is because they perceive that they can't be here. Any departure from the, this line yeah. may impact our test scores. My answer to that is always try it for one year and see what happens to your test scores when you better engage kids and give them a reason to learn what they need to pass on the test. And I think that the efficacy of that speaks for itself. But in terms of getting getting in front of a district, yeah. at least in, in my experience, we work with districts you know, all over the country. Um, actually had 12 people from Honolulu come over, because you know, it's crazy, but Honolulu doesn't have, Hawaii doesn't have a really stand-up CTE program. As a, as a state. Um, and you think if you wanted one CT program in Hawaii, aviation would probably be one of them because, yeah. you know, it's sort of an important. <laughs> it's like being in Alaska and being like airplanes aren't important. I mean, it's like it, it's sort of a big deal, right? And so they came over and asked the exact same questions. You know, how do we do this? Uh, and I hate to say it like this, I'll just be blunt to save time. But for, for most districts, putting in front of them the amount of money that they can obtain through grant programs for this kind of technology is generally the best way to go, oh, there's money in this? Yeah, there's a lot of money out there, um, a lot. Um, and beyond that also, I think, and I, and when we're talking about elementary ed, that's a place we have to get to, but especially now that there there is a nationally recognized high school curriculum from AOPA. It's aligned in GSS that has been adopted all over the place and people understand what that is. Districts are like, oh, there's a, there is a standard for this. Now we gotta get to middle school. Then we gotta get to elementary school. Um, so there's, yes, there's still work to be done there. But I think in elementary school, and I, again, I'm not a school teacher. I would not be qualified in any way. But I think one of the greatest ways to deal with that issue is instead of trying to figure out how to round peg, square hole the curriculum angle to make that work, is just to figure out guest speakers. Just to, to start with that. Because when the kids go home and they tell their parents, we did this really cool thing, and the parents talk to each other, and eventually 
some parent's going to go to a school board meeting and be like, my kid's learning this thing and it's really cool. Why is there not more of this? I mean, in, in, in the experience that I have, a lot of that does, especially when you're talking about lower grades, it's generally grassroots efforts. And there's, I can't, I can't point you to any better solution than the EA chapter network. Right, so you, you've got a national network of people, and I mean, every chapter's different. Some chapters really just want to build airplanes in a hangar, and other chapters focus entirely on no eagles flights. It just, it depends, they're all different. But that's a, that's a great springboard, particularly if we're, you know, you're in some area and you don't, I'm not a pilot, how do I get a pilot to come talk to my kids? Um, I would say also that's a great opportunity for your connection with a company like Redbird because they know a lot of those people and can hook you up with people who do that. Like I, generally speaking, in a month, I do probably 10 to 12 virtual school visits every month. And I tell kids, depending on their age level, I tell them a little bit about my story. I'm not going to tell a fourth grader about doing drugs, dealing drugs. But, <laughs> but, but I will tell the high school kids that. Um, because, you know, well, he can't identify with me. He's like, no, I, I, I can't. I can't. Uh, you know, in a special way. And so I think that's, that's a great start, is just having somebody come and fan that flame. Um, again, in terms of curriculum alignment in elementary school, I haven't figured that out yet. I don't know that anybody's you know, solved that code. If they have, I'm not aware of it. But I have, I love guest speaking with elementary schools. And I can't get to all of them. But I think if COVID taught us anything, it's that you know, we can connect in ways that we maybe before would have discounted. I, I love doing virtual care. I will, anybody you know who wants me to talk to their link, I will gladly do it. I love doing it. A lot of fun. Make a later. Yeah. <laughs> but I know this is a little bit of a, uh, it's not exactly what you were asking, but the biggest problem that we see for school districts to adopt this kind of stuff is finding the teacher that's interested in them enough about it to actually push them through and do it. But it works out way, way better when you have an advocate that wants to do this and drive it through the school, the school district. And we have, I've run into very few people who have not found a way to do it. You know, like most things in life, if you're passionate about it and you want to do it, there, there is a way forward. What's a lot harder is when a CTE director or somebody at the district level decides, hey, this is important, but there's nobody at the, at, in the school that can actually pick it up and do it and carry it forward with a passion. So, you know, I think you, you pass the, the biggest hurdle, right? And that you're interested in actually bringing this uh, to those students. And I don't, you know, even if it starts as an after school, uh, after school or program club. or summer or camp club. program or club, yeah. and then you start, you know, rolling more of that in. That's you know, that's certainly certainly something I wish my my district would do. There's a lot of resources. Yeah. We have a lot of free resources. So if you have a new initiative, we just have interested in like YouTube channels, especially in Florida, it's not like the country. And I, Charlie, well, Charlie could hop Red Bird if he wanted to, but he's not going to. He's not that kind of person. I'm not going to try to hop either, but I will say from the perspective of, to Charlie's point earlier about hardware only versus support, you know, Red Bird has a, a really great on site professional development program. So, like, when a district adopts technology and then doesn't know what to do with it, um, Red Bird staff actually, Harvey's involved in that too, will come to you and sit down with your teachers and teach them how to use this, like how to integrate it in with the classwork. That's an awesome opportunity. And then products like Simulated Flight School, which give the kids, uh, we're gonna talk more about this tomorrow because we're doing, what is it, managing the modern aerospace classroom. Like, we'll talk more about these products then, but those things allow you to, you, it's a workforce multiplier. So it's one teacher, five simulators, and 30 kids. What do we do? Well, so you know, it's it's about it's you know, classroom management is really what it comes down to, and so just having the software or just having the hardware alone is going to create a serious bottleneck for you. 
So having the tools and the resources you need to be able to give those kids something to do and a process to rotate them through, I mean, obviously that helps. I'm sure every school would love to be able to, I'm sure every, every school that comes in for a field trip, the teachers walk into my sim lab and go, oh, I wish I had this in school. And that's great. But it takes four people to manage that and to run that, right? And so it's a, it's an issue of hardware, it's an issue of resource capital for people, it's an issue of classroom management, there's a lot of things to that. And unfortunately, in my experience, to, to Charlie's point, the CTE administrator for the district maybe sees the grant opportunities and funding mechanism and goes, hey, I bought you 10 simulators, you're teaching this class next semester. Well, now you've got two problems. You don't know anything about aviation, and now you've got this hardware that you're expected to use because there's, there's grant validity. You've got to close out a grant and explain to whoever issued you that grant that you did what you were supposed to do with it, but you don't know what a yoke is yet. So, I mean, there's an issue there, and I, I think that's part of what we're going to deal with over the next two days, especially in that breakout tomorrow afternoon if you want to come to that one, is how to deal with that problem, how we source that void between I'm now in here, I don't know the content, I don't know the technology, and all these kids are looking at me like, let's do, let's do aviation. Um, you know, and you, you figure out two weeks before the semester starts, you're the new aerospace teacher. <laughs> how, how do you make that work? Um, so we're gonna try to close that gap too. Any other questions? Yeah, again, I like an on-time departure as well. So you've got exactly from right now, three minutes. Yes, sir. So I'm one of those evil CT directors you talked about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not. Um, You're already. I'm with Marble Schools, and we have a middle school and high school aviation flight. We also have a maintenance program I see too. Um, what you're talking about is absolutely true. There's tons of great, talk, great opportunities. We've got a great $2 million to start a flight program at the middle and high school level and maintenance program. Um, the equipment's great, the space is great, we have the funding, but what we really struggle with is finding instructors at the high school level. Um, there are a lot, and we're in Tennessee, so we're a suburb right outside of Memphis. Right. Um, we are really struggling with finding instructors who want to work full time and or part time, uh, and then also there's endorsements that they have to have in order to teach the standard level course. And I know we can't be the only state. So I just didn't know if you have suggestions or if you work with districts oh, yeah. to try to help that's find a big ways one. to endorse instructors. That's the, actually, that's the most common question I hear from CTRs. Mm -hmm. How do I credential faculty? Yeah. I can't afford airline pilots. We have dual enrollment uh, at high school, so University of Memphis is our partner. They have an aviation program. They provide those instructors, and they've been fantastic. Right. But we don't want to limit it to just 11th and 12th grade students. We want our 9th and 10th graders to have those intro and prerequisite classes. So we have an instructor now that can manage the group. Um, so we're adding one next year. Jobs are posted. Uh, but and I just didn't know if you have any advice about credentialing endorsements and kind of how you help districts work through that. Yeah, so the most successful methodology I've seen so far is the high school college partnership where you're borrowing somebody. Um, but colleges have a hard time with staff too. There are there are a lot of um, there are a lot of folks in industry that are starting to have that conversation about sponsoring positions. Um, we had, we had a, a, a funding for, for three years to set up a, a, one of the high school programs we had when we first started. Um, we had a three-year commitment to fund the teacher position to get it off the ground. Um, so there, there are those opportunities, but it's that's like going and finding a needle in a haystack. The unicorn is what Correct, the purple unicorn. So I think the easiest solution to the curriculum problem that we found in Florida was to reevaluate the way we require credentialing for CTE programs. So typically, in Florida anyway, the CTE programs are also tied to math and science skills. So to teach aerospace technology one, you also have to have like a secondary certification in math. So now you've got somebody who like is a pilot but has, didn't go to school to be an educator, so now they have to go through this regular role to get individual certification. It's the same issue, right? So what we did was to go back and look at that and say, okay, Aerospace Tech 1 and 2 are non-transferable courses. They're not, they're not part of, they're not dual enrollment, right? They're not articulated credit. So then in that case, let's drop 
the math and science credentialing requirement for those classes and make them pure workforce-oriented programs. And then the district, each district in Florida, gets to do district credentialing of their faculty member. So like in Polk County, I'm on the district credentialing committee. So do so they ever find the training? Yes, so, so this person completes the application, gets selected for the position, comes before the credentialing committee, who's industry people, who look at their resume and ask them specific questions about their work experience, and their credential to teach based on work experience, not based on academic requirements. So that's, and it may, that may be a unique Florida thing, but there are aviation programs popping up all over the place, and everybody has the same problem. Nobody can afford six figures to pay somebody to teach an aviation elective. And so, so the only solution is to rethink credentialing, is just to rethink the idea of credentialing, particularly for those for those one and two level classes. Also, you have a cool breakout that I'm coming to later. So, okay. yeah, and I think we're on a panel together tomorrow. So, okay. like, so you look familiar. You little, <laughs> yeah, that looks sort of like your speaker. <laughs> Like okay, all right, minute and a half long, sorry. Um, usually this is where the college students are like. <laughs> I ain't really done though. If you want to stick around and talk to us, please do. Otherwise, I look forward to hanging out with you guys for the next few days. Thank you very much.